Hi, I'm Nancy from Birmingham Contemporary Music Group. I'm here today in the Lickers at the south of Birmingham with Jeff from Birmingham Trees for Life. Jeff, I wondered if you could introduce yourself. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to a slightly wet Licky Hills. And we're so excited to be involved with your project. Thank you, Jeff. And um, can you can tell us a little bit about the history of, of the Lickies. So, yes, I mean, there, there was a time when Birmingham was kind of really expanding out into the uh, out into the countryside. And quite a few people started to get a bit worried that some kind of special places would end up being turned into housing estates or developed for one reason or another. And a lot of attention fell on this area of high ground, which you can see from almost anywhere in Birmingham, uh, which is known as the Licky Hills. So with the Cabris and the Earl of Plymouth and the, the then City Council, there was a huge uh, public push and I, I think even a, an appeal to raise money so that these areas could be bought and kept and used as parks for the future. We're here today to learn about how to identify trees, to learn about the parts of trees, the habitat that trees provide and the life cycle of trees. And I think we could just start with looking, and looking around us here today. What are the different parts of a tree? Um, so, trees are just amazing things, like everything, I suppose, in the living world. And I always think that they're kind of the most important part of the cycle of life. Uh, and in order to kind of grow and, and, and make that positive contribution, they have to start somewhere, and it's usually a seed. How does a seed become this enormous tree? Where it's does amazing. it get all its matter from? It's amazing, isn't it? So it starts off, I suppose, almost like an egg. So inside that seed, there is just about enough food to get it going. Yeah. And hopefully lots of you will have seen, like, whether it's a, whether it's a broad bean seed, whether it's a, a conker, whether it's an acorn, if you stick it in some cotton wool, give it some water, you'll see the roots start to come through and the rest of it then is food. It's, it's uh, like the outside of, of an egg. So the, the yolk is the, is the egg yeah. and then the outside is the food. And then it starts to grow. You get just a couple of leaves, then a couple more, and then it just grows and grows and grows. So let's talk about how you might identify a tree. We're, we're in this beautiful glade in the middle of the woods. Jeff, how, what are the tools you can use to help you to identify a tree? Well, the most important one probably is leaves. And uh, most of us know leaves and every single type of tree has a different kind of leaf. And there are two very, very key factors. The very first one is whether the tree keeps its leaves through the winter, which we call an evergreen tree. There's some right behind me there. All those Scots pines are evergreen. The holly behind you, Nancy, that's an evergreen. And there are trees that lose their leaves that have the big word deciduous. And deciduous means at the end of the summer, the leaves start to change colour and fall off the trees. Now, the last time we were here, there wasn't very many leaves at all. So if you're looking at the trees when they don't have leaves, say in the winter, um, what, what other tools might you have other than leaves? Well, the buds are really helpful. So every single type of tree has a different bud on like For instance, the, the ash tree has got a jet black bud on it. Um, the, um, the beech tree behind you has got like cigar shaped buds. So buds are hugely important. Mm. Bark is another one. So you're even looking around us here, you can see all kinds of different bark. The beech has got a very smooth silver bark on it. The oak tree, I think there's an oak here behind us. It's got a, a much more ridge bark. So certainly buds and bark are two of the key areas and mm. also the shape of them. Yeah, I've you noticed know, that, you know, like the, the oak, you've got much more sort of zigzag, Absolutely, haven't yes. you, of the branches. Yeah. Whereas, whereas if we look up at, um, where are we? Let's have a look, like the pine, it's much more straight yeah, up and a lot of the, lot yeah. on top isn't there. That's right. And that's one, one of the reasons that happens is that the, the pines are trying to get the maximum amount of light they can at the top. So they put most of their energy in, into growing upwards and therefore, as they don't need the bottom branches anymore, the bottom branches die off. And that's what you can see. We call those kegs there, the little branches that have died off in the past. And as it grows bigger and bigger. Mm. And that's how you get telegraph poles, for instance. 
and that's ah, how they like to grow. That's why they plant pine trees very close together so they can grow up and when they cut them down, we can send them straight into telegraph pine. Right. Oh, I love that word you mentioned there, kegging. kegging. It's keg, the keg. So I, yeah. I sort of always thought, you know, they sort of dying off and yeah, it was sort exactly. of an you know, indication of something wrong, but it's actually part Just of the, the what process, the, yeah. the, the tree's doing. Absolutely. Oh, interesting. And, and, and also, if in, in autumn, the, the, of course, there's the fruit of the tree or the seeds oh, of the yeah. tree. And, and, you know, trees are so ingenious, aren't they? I mean, they're clever. Beech trees create beech nuts, which squirrels love, and uh, squirrels then pinch the beech nuts from under the trees and run away somewhere else and find a nice open area, dig a hole in the ground, bury them so they can remember where they are in the winter to eat them, and then forget they're there. And therefore, your beech nut, which came off your beech tree, is now somewhere else, buried yeah. in the ground, ready to grow again. And the holly tree behind you, all those red berries, all the blackbirds eating those, going off, sitting in another tree, out comes the seed after the berry's been digested, they're the holly trees. So it's amazing all the different mechanisms, there are thousands and thousands of them, whereby trees can just get their fruit taken from where they are to yeah. where the new trees are going to grow. That's really interesting. And you, there was a word or a phrase you used last time we talked about those species of tree that get in first. Yeah, so they're, they're the pioneer trees. That's it, yes. And, and what happens if, uh, and I, I was lucky enough a few years ago to go to Africa and, and, and to go to somewhere where a volcano had erupted not too long ago. And all around us was the grey lava field. It, it was it was a bit scary, actually. It was a bit like being on the moon. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, there was a little area where some water had run down, and the very first trees were growing there. And they were the pioneer trees. So they're the first trees that come in. Mm. And so in this country, they tend to be holly. They tend to be silver birch. They tend to be mountain ash. Um, and they come in first. They grow very, very quickly. They've got quite short lives. They only live 45, 50, 60 years. Mm. And then they provide a canopy, if you like, a nursery bed, as we call it. And then underneath them go the oak trees and the beech trees and, and so on and so forth that make the woodland. And they manage to push through, they push through, through that. That's right, yeah. so it's sort of an under, was understory. Understory, that's, understory, right, that's yes, the word, that's isn't right. it? So you talked about those, the hollies and the birches only lasting about 45 years. Yes. You know, if we look at this oak behind us, how old would you say that was? It's well over 100, isn't it? It's probably 150, maybe 200. It de depends how mm. good the soil is, how quickly the trees grow, really. And that's another secret about trees, is that different trees like different things. So you nearly always see a weeping willow tree, for instance, on the side of a river or on the side of a lake because they like water. Mm. Uh, you always tend to see Scots pine, we've got Scots pine behind us. They, they, they're called Scots pine because they come from Scotland and they grow on the mountains and they don't need much soil. And behind us, that's nearly all rock there. And, and therefore, Scots pine are growing in rock, you know. So different trees grow in different places. So, so if there's rock underneath, um, presumably that means their roots can't go into the rock because there's that kind of image we have of the, or, or the, what people say about trees is there's as, mu as much underground as there is overground. If it's rock there, how, how does that work? And they often go sideways. And if you've ever seen a tree that's blown down in a really high wind mm. where there's a very shallow soil, the, the, the bit at the bottom where the roots are, what they call the root plate, is sometimes huge. It's probably, you know, uh, 10 metres wide and th so those roots were going sideways but mm. in good fertile land then the roots do go down yeah. and therefore you're less likely for the tree to blow down then but uh, certainly th th the story is that there's as much under the ground as there is on top. I, I've read recently that trees can communicate through their roots. Is it, what, it, I don't think we really understand all of it yet but there are there's a kind of a fungal network under the ground called mycorrhiza, another big word, Mm. Uh, but it, it's all about a, a network of, uh, of roots and fungus under the ground. And I think increasingly as science progresses, we realise that trees do, do have some way of kind of communicating with each other. I don't mm. think they talk to each other like <laughs> we're talking to you now, but I think they do kind of communicate to each other. I wonder, uh, I wonder, children, if, if you imagine these trees somehow talking to each other, what would they be saying to each other? So we're, we're in a really different part of the wood now, Jeff. Um, lots of fallen logs around us and this huge great stump here. Can you just tell us a little bit about where we are now? 
So this is a grove of uh, sweet chestnuts, Nancy, and behind you is one that blew down in, in a storm some time ago. And when they came to have a look at it and what have you, they realised, unfortunately, that a number of these sweet chestnuts were, were infected with a disease called Phytophthora. Uh, unfortunately, trees have diseases just like we do. Mm. Uh, and in the case of this, it, it does transmit from tree to tree. So uh, these trees had to be taken down, as you see. But one of the benefits of having to chop down trees, and of course, new ones are grown here already, thankfully, is that we get to see the bit of the tree that we couldn't see before, which is the inside bit. Mm. And it's absolutely fascinating because everybody thinks that the whole tree is alive and it's not. It's only the very outside of the tree that's alive. The rest of it, the heartwood, is actually dead. It was alive once, but as each ring, each year's growth goes on, the middle bit dies out. It's still solid, mm -hmm. as you can see, yeah. but it's actually not alive. The live bit is round the edge. And, and so, so how does all the goodness and the moisture, the water, get to the rest of the tree? So inside here, they, we have something called a cambium, which is a whole network of, of like tunnels and that takes all the nutrients and all the water up the tree mm. into the branches and into the leaves. So it's, it's almost like a pipe on the outside of a pipe. So that's how the water gets up. Yeah. And that's what makes the tree grow. As the tree grows, it creates a new cambium each year. So the cambium is the this sort of the layer, under the, bark, the yeah. layer under the bark. Under the bark. So the bark it. just expands, does yep, it? Yeah, the bark just expands. So there's the cambium there. You can probably see it on that one there. So that's before the tree was chopped down. That's where all the water and all the nutrients go up. Yeah. The bark is on the outside to protect the cambium because the cambium is really, really important. And as we can see. You then get, each year, this tree grows, mm. it creates a new cambium, and we get things called growth rings. And I don't know whether the camera can pick these up. It's probably better here if I turn that there. Can you see all those rings across there? Every one of those is one year's growth. And if we got enough time and I've got a magnifying glass, we could actually stand here for the next probably 20 minutes and count how many rings there are on this tree, which would tell us it, it probably 150 years old. 150, you reckon? Put something like that, probably, yeah. And the other thing about the rings is that if it's a, a bad year for growth, so if it's a very dry year or, if, or something happens, very cold year, and the tree doesn't grow very well, the rings are very narrow. Mm. If it's a very good year, then the rings are very far apart. So again... Ah. When you start to take this into a laboratory and cut it open and slice it up, you can work out the cold winters, the dry summers, everything else just from these trees. So, and their it's, rings. so it's like a kind of document, historical is, document, yes, isn't absolutely. it, of the weather? And some of the really old trees, you know, they can they can go back to like Robin Hood and, and Elizabeth the First and and way beyond that. Really, they're almost like a as you say, they're almost like a story, a story of people's lives, if you like. It's fascinating, isn't it? It really is. And I, I've noticed when I've been in woods recently that logs and um, felled trees are less likely to be taken away these days. You know, is that purposeful? Yeah, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, lots of people can't burn it anymore because like, if you're in a smokeless zone, yeah. uh, you can't actually burn logs. Uh, but the other reason is probably the most important one is that these are fantastic places for all kinds of insects and animals. Mm. So these, these logs will become home for thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of insects and types of fungus. And, and from them, the woodpeckers and all those kind of birds will have something to feed on. So they create a fantastic habitat. So what kinds of sort of beetles might we all, find? All kinds. There? There's a whole army. I, I, we, there's people who spend their whole lives just... <laughs> talking about beetles but yeah. yeah there's a whole army of insects and things around here if we could get close enough to it I and mean, we had magnifying glasses we'd be amazed that this is a whole world just in this little corner here living on these dead trees so so something we'd really like to encourage you to do when you go out to the wood is is look for an old rotting piece of wood probably a fairly big one and turn it over and see what you see underneath it how many creatures can you find in there 
Now, Jeff, you also mentioned um, fungi and lichens and um, mosses. And so we've got, you know, here we've got some absolutely beautiful lichen. We've got, yeah, well, let's start, actually, let's start with lichen. Am I right? You said, I think last time we met, that, um, you know, about 20 years ago, there was a lot less lichen. Yeah, is, is that, yeah, is that abs right? Absolutely. So certainly in Birmingham, certainly 30 or 40 years ago, you probably wouldn't have seen any lichen. Uh, the, the air was so polluted, in fact, there was sulphur, mainly from burning coal, um, that um, lichens couldn't grow on trees uh, in, in Birmingham. So uh, there was a whole, whole generation of trees had no lichens on. The air is now so clear that you can see absolutely beautiful lichen growth there. And of course, mosses. You get mm. So that's just the bark of a tree. And look at all that beautiful moss growing on there. And sometimes you'll have ivy growing on there and all manner of things. And on the dead branches then you start to get like fungus. Here's, here's some nice funguses you can see there. Where the camera can quite pick that up, but they're like, like little uh, spider, uh, little long mushrooms there. So that's all a fungus. So that, that branch has died. And that fungus is now breaking it down slowly but surely. And in the end, it will completely break it down. It'll just go back into the soil again. So all part of that cycle of life. Mm, and if we, if we look around us, at the forest floor you know, it's such a mix of bark of dead leaves it's like a, it's a it's sort of strong rich mulch and presumably this then fertilizes it goes back into sort of creating the right environment for new trees to grow in yes it's a bit early yet for the pioneer trees but even behind us here just just behind you there nancy yeah. so there, there is the famous silver birch often one of the very very first trees to come in and over there we saw some holly um, and we also saw some, some young beech trees where I have presumed the squirrels probably buried the beech nuts previously and they've germinated. So as soon as one tree leaves, for whatever reason, another tree starts to come in again. And it's wonderful. Mm. And, that, and that's, what ha that's what, if we didn't farm in this country, um, mm. most of this country, apart from the tops of mountains, would be woods and, you know, the Forest of Arden and that. It's, uh, somebody mentioned to us recently, didn't they, that... Uh, mm. We probably chopped most of our trees down to build an navy a long time ago. So most of most yeah. of this country before we farmed it was covered in woodland. Yeah, that's it's extraordinary to think Absolutely. how different the landscape Absolutely. would be like that. So we think about fir and pine trees producing cones, uh, and I guess we have a mental image of what a cone might might look like, and I'm sure you have one. But here on the, this lovely stump, we have a whole range of different pine cones. Um, can, you, can you identify um, some of these, no. Jeff? I mean, I, I'm putting you on the spot here. No, no, not at all. So pine cones are fascinating, aren't they? It's a brilliant way to spread seeds. So they, they seeds start off deep inside the cone. As, as they get ripe, they start to open up. And then on a really windy day, they fully open up and then they blow on the tree like that. So there's actually seeds. So the seeds, these aren't the seeds. Ah. The seeds are right down inside the pine cone. So some of these are, re that one's very wide open, Absolutely. isn't it? Absolutely. So all Whereas the seeds have gone. One. That one hasn't opened up at all yet. No. So that's how the seeds actually spread. Mm. And there's lots of ways that seeds spread. I mean, here's a favourite. Everybody knows those. When I was young, we used to <coughs> put them in vinegar and then pop them in the oven. It's a conker, of course, isn't it? Yes. And that's the seed of the horse chestnut tree. And again, it comes in, in a spiky cover. And that's the actual conker. That's the seed. It actually, that's not a conker. Is that, that, is that a conker? It looks like a very small kind of a conker. You, you normally yeah. see them bigger than that. They're green. And there's, there's a, another different kind here. So that's, that's a kind of a hazelnut. You can see that the nuts inside there. Look. Mm -hmm. So it's a great... In the autumn, it's a great thing to do to, when you go out into the parks and woods to, to look at the trees and see what kind of seeds they have on them. So the holly mm. has the holly berry, yes. uh, the hazelnut has hazelnuts, fir trees have fir cones on them, lots and lots of different... This one's a sweet chestnut. And I think um, we've got a sweet, a very slightly moldy... There, there is a little sweet chestnut. Nut and if you go down to London, even now, you can still buy, still buy roasted chestnuts whereby they roast them on an open fire yeah. and then you just crack them open and eat them. So, yeah, loads and loads and loads of different fruits on trees, all to help them um, produce new trees for future generations. 
I mean, do we know? I mean, that's I think is a cedar, isn't it? Yeah, that's Can, a cedar. Yeah. Is do you know where? But well, they'd be one of the pinus. I don't know yeah. which, because without having all the books here to tell you no. which. But uh, yeah, that's, and, and every kind of pine tree has a different pine cone. So you spoke earlier about how you tell different trees apart. Another way of telling them apart is what kind of fruit they have. So as we just said, sweet chestnut has sweet chestnuts, and we know that the ash tree has, the, has and the sycamore have the helicopters, which we see coming down. Mm. The oak tree, of course, has, what does the oak tree have, Nancy? Acorns. Well, I couldn't find any acorns no, to bring. No, couldn't find any acorns. <laughs> That's because the squirrels have had them all and buried them. That's why. Uh, now, this is not a fruit, is it? No. So a little hole in it as if well. You, if, if you're an oak tree, this is a pesky little thing. It's called an oak gall. And a little insect goes and it bores a hole and it plants its larva inside, mm. which aggravates the tree and makes it grow this oak gall. Once it's grown, the larva eats the inside of it and then it bores a hole through yeah. so it can get out. What is it when it comes out? It's like a little insect. Like it's a wasp or Yeah, a... it's an oak it's, a, it's an oak gall wasp. Ah, okay. And am I am I right in thinking those sort of nobbles that you see on trees as well? Is that to do with some kind of pest Ve like that? Very often that'll be some kind of a gall wasp that's gone there and uh, a bit like something but that bites us and makes our legs swell up. In the case of a tree, it makes it create a gall. So it's almost it's like called. a sort of scab, isn't it? It's like it? a scab, exactly. Yeah, it's sort of, it, it sort of heals, kind yeah. of comes over to and heal. And the reason it does that is because mm. it's laid its eggs in there. Yeah. And it wants that gall to grow so that those mm. eggs, when they become larvae, have got something to feed on. Yeah. And then when they're big enough to come out and pupate and hatch. Yes. Yeah, there, that's, that's the their way. life cycle. Yeah. As we said before, so... Millions and millions of different insects and things all have their life cycles because we've had trees. And if we didn't have any trees, yeah. they wouldn't have anywhere to live. And so, you know, the, 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 the animals disperse the seeds, but then different animals. And then, of course, so if you think about the birds, the birds disperse the seeds. They the, 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 the birds need insects to eat. And then you've got things like the gulls, wasps, what you eat. So it's all some big cycle. And it's take one cycle. bit of it away, you lose yeah, everything, yeah, really, absolutely. which is so important. Why it's so important to to protect woodlands and to yeah to yeah so I think I think we'd like to finish by just encouraging you to go out into your local wood maybe take it find an app I think on our website there'll be some apps you can use for identifying trees see what you can find see what are fruits and nuts and cones of trees that you can find when you're out as well and that's the other thing you can do is very lots of schools have now got forest schools which is great mm. and even if you haven't got one at your school there's probably one in your area uh, so you'll have the internet uh, look up forest schools um, go to your local park and talk to the park rangers or the friends groups lots of ways you can get involved and maybe you can come along and plant some trees maybe you can come plant some trees with us we'd love that yeah well hopefully maybe because you don't plant trees in the summer do you no we plant them in the winter yeah, so maybe there'll be a chance later on to do that. Well, thanks, Jeff. Thanks so much for spending the time with us today. We've learned so much from you about trees. And yeah, thanks so much. And, and thanks for coming along. It's just great. And the fact that they would influence art and music and things like that, I think is brilliant. And I'm so looking forward to listening <laughs> to the compositions. Yeah, me too. Me too.